Hi, my name is Pat Iyer, and it's my pleasure to bring to you Allison Dixon, who is a legal nurse consultant with experience in the emergency department and in looking at quality improvement issues. Allison, let's talk about how your experience as working in the ER and as a quality nurse gives you the background that's helpful when it comes to legal nurse consulting. My background, background, background in ER and quality uh, really cross over into LNC work because a lot of personal injury accidents happen and then they come into the emergency department. Um, so that's a huge portion of cases that you'll see as a legal nurse consultant. As far as quality goes, we're looking at every incident that happens in the hospital. We review almost every record in the hospital, especially if there's any form of litigation or potential litigation. Um, you know, the ER is a hot, hot place where litigation can occur. People are unhappy in the ER. It's their worst day. Um, so, you know, emotions are running high. Um, so having that background of being able to review all of those records um, and working as a nurse in the emergency department where those things happen is a great crossover into legal nurse consulting. Yeah, I could see why that would be very helpful. I know that I've gotten a lot of calls from attorneys over the years with concerns of patients about what happened in the emergency department. And you yeah. mentioned a couple of factors of emotions running high. It's the worst experience. Nobody wants to have to go to the emergency department. What are some of the other factors that make it particularly high risk for litigation? So one of the biggest things that we're seeing um, as patients in the ER, but also as uh, people who work in the ER as nurses or physicians, the biggest th thing that hospitals are pushing are throughput. Um, getting patients in, getting them seen by a provider, getting them to their next place of disposition, whether that be home or admitted to the hospital, transferred to a higher level of care. But when you're pushing for people to be seen so quickly, a lot of times things can be missed. Um, so misdiagnosis or missed diagnosis is probably the biggest factor that you're going to see in those quality metrics. Um, as far as, you know, from a quality standpoint, things that are going to happen that are going to be bad in the emergency department. Another thing is HCAPs, you know, that's a huge quality standard. And when you're pushing people through really quickly, it can be good. Um, people want to get in and out, but it can also be bad because people feel like you're not taking the time to listen to them or take care of them. All right, Lola, let me back you up a minute. And you said H caps. Yes. Can you define that for sure our can. audience? <laughs> so H caps really are, um, they're the surveys that patients will get after they've been seen in the hospital. And they ask you about your quality of care. If your doctors came in and saw you timely, did they take care of your pain? Did they answer your question? Really, it's a satisfaction survey. And hospitals are graded on that. And we also use them internally to make improvements. And that's where quality improvement comes in. We look at those comments and we look at those scores to see where we're falling um, behind in those metrics. And who is grading the hospitals? For our international <laughs> listeners, let's give them a little bit of um, a background on this. CMS um, is grading us, Joint Commission is grading us, our states are grading us. Um, the Leapfrog Group is another thing that, um, you know, healthcare in the United States is a consumer product. And so people now are really publicizing how good you are because you have a choice of where you can go to receive health care. Um, and one of the projects that I've worked on multiple times in the quality department is LeapFrog. And LeapFrog is um, 
where you can go and look at your healthcare facility and get their safety grading and they'll be graded A, B, C, D. And obviously it's just like school grading, A is better, D is bad. Um, and it's based on um, specific metrics and you can drill down on their website to see where your hospital is doing well or where your hospital's failing. All right, and to go back one more level, CMS and the Joint Commission, can you explain those entities? Yes, so CMS is our government. It's the Center for Medicare and Medicaid. And if you're a hospital that um, gets Medicare dollars, which most hospitals do, um, you have to live up to their standards and their conditions and their regulations. Um, Joint Commission, uh, they are, you can pay them and they are um, a deemed status. And what that means is they have an agreement with CMS, who is the government entity, um, that they can come in every three years at least uh, <laughs> and do the survey for CMS. And if you live up to uh, the Joint Commission standards, CMS will say, yes, you're fine to continue operating. We'll continue to pay you the Medicare dollars. If you don't meet their standards, CMS can come in and they can live there at your hospital forever. <laughs> and uh, then you're at risk if you have any major issues for CMS withholding the Medicare dollars. And that's what really keeps hospitals open. Um, and if you're not getting your Medicare dollars, most likely you're gonna have to shut down your hospital. But there's also obviously some other major issue going on that CMS or Joint Commission would say, stop, there's something going on here. Um, and it's typically a very, very um, intense patient safety issue. All right. Well, thank you for laying some of that groundwork for us. You're very welcome. I am very passionate about regulatory compliance as well. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned so far the, the anxiety of the patients surrounding the circumstances that led to having to go to the emergency department. And you talked about that throughput issue of getting people in and out as quickly as possible. No one wants to spend, as one of my relatives did this year, four days in the emergency department waiting for a bed to open up upstairs or to lay in a hallway of an emergency department, which is even worse. He was in a private room, which was wonderful for his family to be able to see him. But a hallway is cold, drafty, noisy, busy, and even worse. Yes. Um, I know an emergency department nurse practitioner, by the way, who said that the emphasis on throughput meant that she was working on medical records at home after she left work, trying to reconstruct the details of the patients she saw. Yeah. Does that surprise you at all, Allison? It does not. And in there was a hospital that I worked in that shall remain nameless <laughs> um, during this whole initiation of throughput in vertical patients and horizontal patients and um, patients being treated in uh, the waiting room. And the way that it worked is in the morning, you had less nurses and it built up throughout the middle of the day. And then as the day ended, you went down to less nurses. And if you were put out in the front, uh, which was where we would see these vertical patients. So vertical patients are patients that are not needing a bed because they're not as sick. Um, you know, they, they have a headache or they have a, uh, a sore foot, you know, things that aren't urgent or emergent. Um, and we would see these patients out in the lobby. Well, at nighttime, when I would come in, there would be, you know, 30 some patients out in the waiting room that were these vertical patients. And then we would dwindle down and even our providers would be gone from out in the front. We wouldn't have a provider anymore. They would have reported off to a physician in the back who was responsible for them. So then at the end of the night, you know, like three o'clock in the morning, I would be solely responsible for whatever patients were left over that we were waiting for results on or waiting for a reassessment on. And that could be anywhere up to 20, 25 patients. That's scared. 
the heck out of me because mm-hmm. that, that meant that I had 20 people that I was responsible for that my license, now they were supposed to be, you know, not sick, but everybody knows in the emergency room, you're not sick until you're, <laughs> until you're sick and then you're really sick. Um, and I've had people in the emergency room, waiting room that are fine and then they go bad. Um, so there is a lot of room for, and you have to have really strong triage nurses. Um, I was actually talking to someone yesterday and saying, I felt that when I worked in the ER, that you had to have stronger triage nurses than you had trauma nurses. At least in the trauma bay, you had the support of physicians and other nurses. You're out in triage, you're off on an island and you're responsible for the 30 plus people out there. And when you work in a big city, more than 30. Um, And those are your people, those people are your responsibility. And so you have to have really great triage skills to be able to determine who's sick and who's not sick and to trust your nursey sense and go, uh, they're complaining of this, but there's something that's just not right. And you also have to be really good investigator. I'll never forget a patient that I had come in who came in for a a reeval of a burn she had. And as our practice, we always check diabetics' blood sugars when they were in triage, no matter if they were there for their blood sugar or not. Well, her blood sugar was like in the 20s. And I said, did you take your your medicine today? And she said, yeah, I took all of it. I took all of my regular insulin for the entire day because I thought I was going to be sitting out in the waiting room all day. A regular triage nurse who doesn't have a lot of practice maybe wouldn't have checked her blood sugar and wouldn't have known that her blood sugar was in the twenties. So um, you have to be very diligent with who you're having be your triage nurses. They have to be your best nurses. Yes. And, and then somebody has to be responsible for checking the patients in the waiting room to make sure that they're not quietly dying in their chair. Yes. And which has happened. That happens. Yes. (laughs) It's a scary place. Oh, it is. It is. And only legal nurse consultants could laugh about this too, because if I'm sitting there, I'm thinking that's probably pretty inappropriate, Pat, to giggle at the idea yeah. of somebody quietly dying in their chair, but it happens. It, yeah. it, I've seen a number of cases of people who were not correctly triaged or not brought back soon yeah. enough or yeah. had some catastrophe that was brewing and no one was aware. Yes. Triage is a, it's the battlefield. It's like the front lines. <laughs> you know, the other thing that scares me about the emergency department is anyone and anything could walk through the doors or be wheeled up to the doors from the one day old infant to the hundred plus year old geriatric woman who fell in the nursing home, the enormity of the age range and the conditions, both medical and surgical, means a a high level of skill in terms of especially diagnosis. And and then you add in, okay, got to make your decision quickly and move the patient on. You add um, those factors together, you have a, a battlefield for missed diagnosis or delays in diagnosis or incorrect diagnosis. How does that play into the liability issues that you've seen? The one thing that as a legal nurse consultant, I see a lot of, which is really sad to me is a physician or a provider will make a bad call and they'll have a patient who comes in and they have a complaint of chest pain and shortness of breath and a history of DVT, for example. And I'm saying this because I've just saw this incident (laughs) and they say, you know, it's been years since I've had a DVT. I'm only 30 years old and they do a typical workup. And then they say, well, you're dehydrated and I think you just need to rehydrate and you'll be fine. But there needs to be a stop there as a nurse. And I think that's where 
what really upsets me just because I'm an old ER nurse. <laughs> so where was the nurse in this? Because you really, as a nurse, are the final stop to say, wait a minute, this patient has a history of DVT. We didn't get any imaging. We didn't get a D-dimer. We didn't do this. We didn't do that. I'm not comfortable with this patient leaving. Um, and I see that a lot. And I see it time after time, actually, where nurses don't feel empowered to stand in their power to say, wait a minute, there's something wrong here. There's something that's not right. We shouldn't be sending this patient home. Um, and I think that that really is something that nurses need to be able to do. Um, and I don't know, I know that in my end of my career as a nurse in the ER, there were a lot of new nurses that were coming into the emergency department, um, you know, that straight out of school. And that is scary um, because like we just talked about, it's such a, a place where you're in a battlefield. People go from fine to, to bad. People come in bad. You have to know a lot about everything. Um, and if you're not fully prepared for that, um, when I worked at the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania, they only took on, I think, maybe four new graduates a year. And those new graduates had to go through a rigorous program. They were with a preceptor for a year and they had to present um, workups that they had seen in the emergency department and do presentations. Um, so you have to be really well prepared. And I think as far as misdiagnosis goes, the more people you have in your corner that are saying to you, wait a minute, something's not right. Maybe, shouldn't we do this? Shouldn't we try this? Um, it's going to be the best. Um, and always advocating for the patient is, is the most important factor. Before we continue with the show, I'd like to share this special announcement with you. Are you looking for an exciting conference to attend while earning continuing education units? Have you considered exploring other areas within nursing? Would you like to become a legal nurse consultant or advance your current practice? The LNC Success Conference, this is actually our sixth conference being held virtually October 27, 28, 29, 2022. Patricia Iyer and I have collaborated on all of these successful conferences. We know how valuable your time and money are, and thus we have organized a dynamic team of speakers for you. The audit you can be, understanding EMR and device audit data. One of our speakers is attorney Megan Shore Taka. She is an EMR audit trail consultant and a plaintiff's personal injury attorney. She litigates cases involving medical malpractice, birth injury, nursing home, and assisted living, abuse, and neglect cases. Throughout her career, Megan has a 100% success rate at obtaining compensation for her clients. Megan is listed as a Super Lawyer Illinois 2021 and a 2022 Rising Star. I can certainly see why. Throughout her career, her cases have been highly publicized in the media, including CBS, ABC, and NBC. Megan consults with legal nurses and attorneys to assist them with EMR and auditing processes. Welcome, Megan. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So I'd love for you to share a little bit about your program that you'll be teaching for our conference. Yeah, absolutely. So the program is going to be for individuals that have either no idea how to uh, even look at an audit trail or what to look for in an EMR um, to someone who's also very advanced. So there will be a quick uh, audit trail one-on-one, but more importantly, looking into various EMR systems that are often overlooked that already have really excellent audit data within the EMR chart itself. Um, and having that foundation with having the complete full legal version of the chart in its native digital format is going to be the most important part of getting the case started so that you can look at audit trails. 
Um, and so I'll get into the various types of audit trails. I'll discuss that there are different devices, so it won't just be about the electronic medical record, but we'll be talking about various devices from Pitocin pumps to going to the laboratory to pathology slides. Um, there is a universe of data out there, including, of course, cell phones. Um, you'll hear from me about uh, Epic Haiku, which is used on cell phones and various forms of communicating and that type of data that's available as well. This is really exciting and this is very important information for those who are just starting their practice to introduce them to, and certainly even those that are the most senior legal nurse consultants. Well, this is very exciting to have um, you present this program. And I'm sure that you will talk about some case studies and bring some of that forth to us. Yes, yes, absolutely. The devil is in the details for sure. Exactly, it is. Well, please join us October 27, 28, 29, 2022. This program will be videotaped. So if you are unable to attend the entire program live, then there will be an option for you to sign up for both live and the videos. Please see the link below, lnc.tips forward slash October 2022 virtual. We look forward to seeing you. Thank you. Now let's return to the show. Yeah, without the nurse standing there saying, excuse me, wait a minute, but this isn't right. Yeah. There are many things that would slip by. Absolutely. And I've seen it and I've seen nurses save lives by doing that, by saying, wait, stop. Let's think about this. Um, and in the best institutions that I've worked in, the physicians were always asking the nurses, how do you feel about this? What is your feeling on this? You're with the patient more than I am. You know the patient better than I do. Um, what are your feelings? And it's always, even in a code, they always want to ask us, okay, we're going, we're thinking about ending this code. Do you feel okay with that? Do you think that we did everything that we should have done? Um, and they won't stop until everybody is comfortable with feeling like we've did, we've done everything that we should have done to help save the patient. Let's focus on some of the treatment related issues in the ER. We've talked about the diagnosis issues, the, the rush to get the patient out of the system to order the appropriate diagnostic tests, to read the interpretation yeah. of the diagnostic test to make sure that somebody has eyed the results or the results have been given to the decision maker. Yes. There's another breakdown right there. Yeah. But in terms of the treatment, you've got lots of meds, lots of things that are being done to patients. You've got critically ill people who come in literally off the street from car crashes and there's so many aspects of what needs to be done quickly and with skill. Where are some of the stumbling blocks related to that piece? I think um, the thing that comes to my mind the, immediately, um, just because it's so dangerous, is pediatric patients um, and being aware of their weight um, and getting a weight on them um, because all of their medications will need to be weight-based. Um, and I see it in every institution that I'm in, there's always an incident with a pediatric patient and getting the wrong dose of medication, whether it's too big, too small, um, because they didn't get a weight. So that's one thing that I would say is really important. And not just pediatric patients, a lot of adult medications are weight-based as well. Um, TPA, you wanna make sure that you get a patient weight. Um, so making sure if you have a stroke patient coming in that they get on the on the scale and to the cat scanner um, also making sure that you are clearing a c-spine appropriately um, that's something that happens a lot too is that you know, just willy-nilly take a c collar off and the patient will get home and they'll end up having numbness and tingling and then they found out later they had a fracture in there that's the other thing about the emergency department i mean a lot of the times physicians are relying on wet reads from x-rays instead of waiting for final reads. And we just have to be aware of that too. 
that preliminary results aren't final results. Um, a lot of times patients will get called at home for blood cultures um, to come back in. Your blood culture came back positive. So um, a lot of the time, the things that are done in the ER are never finished um, before the patient's discharged. So it's just such a high, high risk area for lots of things. <laughs> you know, that makes me think about the service. I think it was called Nighthawk and it might still yes. exist, right? Yes. <laughs> of physicians in another part of the world from the hospital who are interpreting results because it's 3 a.m., as you mentioned, in Alabama, and it's 3 p.m. in another country. Mm -hmm. um, Australia, India are, are two that come to mind. There's usually, in India, it's 10 and a half hours of time difference from the East Coast because I have a son who <laughs> lives in India, so I'm aware of that time zone difference. The concept of having a physician in another country reading the results and then communicating to the ER staff, here's what I see, because no radiologists are awake in that right. small hospital in the middle of the night. Can you comment at all on how does that work? And um, and I'm always curious about the liability if the physician in the other country misinterprets the results, who's ultimately responsible for that? Yeah. You know, I worked in a very small hospital and we used Nighthawk and specifically Nighthawk. And it was always, um, it added a lot of time actually to our length of stay. Um, it took a while to get results from them. Um, and so we did have a lot of people that would be waiting and waiting and waiting. And so not only was it an issue if they misinterpreted or misread, but we would have patients that would leave. Um, they would leave AMA because they were ready to go. They'd been there for hours and they were ready to go. And so um, that presents another issue, patients leaving against medical advice um, without all of their testing being back. Um, you know, I think we handled it the best way that we could. You only can do what you can do. We would <laughs> really good at nagging and calling and bugging. And, um, you know, they, they were receiving, I'm sure, tons of re radiology results from all across wherever they're, uh, you know, whoever they were contracted with. So I'm not actually sure who's, who it would fall to. Um, if they misread and we, went off of their diagnosis, I'm sure it would have, they would have liability and we would have liability as well. Um, you know, that's the thing about legal nurse consultants. We're the ones that have to dig in those records and go, Hey, you know, this physician in India <laughs> is the one who gave us the result saying that it was okay. Um, that this, you know, C-spine was clear. Um, so LNCs can pick out all the different defendants, um, and who is liable in all different areas. So you know, I'm not sure necessarily an attorney would know um, all the different players in a game. I have a vague recollection of seeing on those results that it was interpreted by a physician with a specific service name. So that if you read the results carefully, you can identify that that is not an employee of the hospital. Yes. So in the remaining time, Allison, we have a few more minutes. What would be the advice that you would give to a legal nurse consultant who does not have an emergency department background in terms of what they should be paying attention to as they look at these cases? Well, even if you don't have an emergency nursing background, you know the standard of care. As a nurse, you know you just, you have, like I said, you have that nursey sense. You're like, something isn't quite right. Um, but always reach out. Um, you know, I would be more than happy to help anybody who's not an emergency nurse with emergency nursing records um, and going, kind of answering those questions. But there is a plethora of legal nurse consultants out there. That's, we all help each other. Um, that's why we all have different specialties. That's why we all, um, 
get together and do podcasts like this so that you know, oh, I have a friend. <laughs> I know somebody. Um, so don't be afraid to reach out. If you don't know something, don't pretend like you do, just like any other nursing job that you have. Ask questions, um, dig a little deeper, do your research, phone a friend. <laughs> that is my best advice is we're out here. We're willing to help you. Let us help you. You'll pay back the favor because whatever your specialty is, I'm sure I'll need that later because I'm an ER nurse, jack of all trades, master of none. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think that's the biggest thing. There's a huge network of us. Use us. And that leads me to my final question. How can people find out more about you, the services you offer, and your contact information? I have a website. It's vitallegalnurse.com. That's where all of my information is to get in touch with me, to email me, to call me. Um, but I'm on all social media, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, um, Twitter, whoever uses Twitter still. <laughs> Um, but you can find me there under my name, Allison Dixon, D-I-C-K-S-O-N, um, and looking up the hashtag, hashtag Vital Legal Nurse. All right. And to spell out for people who are listening to this, Allison's first name has two L's in it, A-L-L-I-S-O-N, Dixon, D-I-C-K-S-O-N. And her website is Vital, V-I-T-A-L, LegalNurse.com. Yes. And Allison's got background, as you've heard us discussing, in one of the, the fastest paced aspects of healthcare today, that, um, that carousel, the spinning doors, it's like walking into a hotel, and that right. door is that, that goes around in a circle always scares the hell out of me, I should say, Allison, because I'm always afraid that I'm going to slow down and I'm going to get right. whacked in the back. That's right. If you don't move fast enough, you will get whacked by the <laughs> ER. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Allison, for sharing your expertise with us. I know that you've given some tips and insights that will be new to many of our listeners. And I appreciate you sharing your knowledge with this group of people who are listening to this podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It's always so much fun speaking with you. As well for me. And I'm Pat Iyer with Legal Nurse Podcast. Please be sure if you're watching this on our YouTube channel, which is Legal Nurse Business, to give a like, leave a comment, subscribe to the channel, check out what other videos we have. Uh, Allison has done another podcast with us and be sure to check that one out. We've talked about some marketing techniques that she's very effectively used and be sure to come back for the next show. Thanks so much. We talked a lot in Lylan Bowa's podcast about cardiac care. This is a big area with big damages, literally the difference between life and death. And in Lylan's podcast, we focused on those factors that can result in delay in diagnosis or misdiagnosis. As an LNC, you could be asked to help attorneys by screening cases and doing a detailed chronology or timeline of the events. So this is an area where undoubtedly you can provide great assistance to attorneys. Be sure to check out her show. Thanks so much.